Okay, we are back on TalkBack, and uh, John, this is a highly anticipated interview here. Yeah, I've been very excited for this interview. Uh, so we're speaking with a Montanan, first of all, which is awesome. Uh, not only that, he's a farmer in Montana. He works up at Kid Brothers Farms, as far as I understand. Uh, his name is Dan Kidd, but the big thing that sets him apart from most Americans is that he's intimately involved in the trade negotiations currently going on between U.S. and 11 other countries, including Japan and I think Brunei and New Zealand and a whole bunch of other places scattered across the Pacific. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but he is, as far as I understand, a member of the Agriculture Policy Advisory Committee and is able to kind of watch the negotiations unfold. These are the, you probably heard them talked about in the press as the secret negotiations. <laughs> and uh, so uh, if you have a question, please call and uh, Dan will try to give you an answer. Now, he has told me ahead of time that there are certain things he can't talk about because the negotiations are still going on. And everyone should realize that there isn't a final draft yet. Okay. Um, so uh, keep those things in mind. Uh, Dan's not a, a forecaster. He's not a, a prophet as far as I know. He's just a farmer. So <laughs> thanks for joining us today, Dan. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> uh, now, now, Dan, if, if you wouldn't mind, if you wouldn't mind, for those of us who are ignorant of trade agreements, okay, we hear about them, we read about them, we, but we have no idea what they're about. Just on a general level, uh, when you're talking country to country, uh, t describe the average trade agreement, or is there such a thing? Well, the the WTO framework would kind of outline, uh, you know, how all trade agreements are created. Um, <clears throat> but basically, what it really entails is a rules based trading, where you have a defined set of rules uh, for phytosanitary. Uh, issues, uh, dispute resolution issues. Um, you know, you, you, you ship a vessel of uh, pulse crops to uh, India, which uh, we, we have to rely on uh, WTO rules there because we don't have a trade agreement. And uh, they accept this vessel under the these terms, and then we turn around and send another vessel four months later, and they reject it. Uh, even though it's the the terms were exactly the same, but they say, well, it contains some weed seed, or uh, it has some insect in it, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> you know, the point being is, it's it's just a trade blocking measure. They didn't need that second uh, a vessel of pulse crops. Is is the reality? Or uh, what usually ends up happening is is it becomes uh, a negotiation on price. So, <clears throat> so what trade agreements try to do is is uh, eliminate that type of situation, so that you have a set of rules that you you trade under. Uh, you have science based uh, uh, credentials for all phytosanitary, so that it's it's agreed upon in advance. Can you break that word down real quick? Phytosanitary, can you explain what that means for us ignorant folks like, like John Key? Like me. Uh, well, phytosanitary basically is, is um, laying out um, uh, both insects. Uh, in layman terms, what it does, it defines what weeds, in, you know, this gets complicated because, you know, when you go over to livestock, or you know, it, it becomes different, okay? But, but this is so, like uh, uh, making sure it's, uh, in livestock, it'd be like foot and mouth disease or... Um, uh, mad cow disease. Or, or in, in grain, it would be uh, certain types of weeds that might infect the local uh, herb, uh, the local produce or something like that. Well, correct. It'd be like, like identifying a weed seed that, that doesn't exist in that particular country, so they're going to say they will reject any cargo that has X weed seed in it because that seed that weed doesn't exist in that country, and so they're they're protecting themselves, you know. And and, and the same goes for us too. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that that even though we are the most open country in the world when it comes to trade, there are certain things that we we protect, and those are laid out in the phytosanitary standards. Okay. Now, now, 
Um, <clears throat> so let's just say uh, we're we're trading with New Zealand. Uh, they ship us uh, something full of cane toad or something that we don't want, <laughs> and we uh, we we uh, we want to send it back. In the current system, can we do that? Just say we're not going to take uh, this shipment. Yes, yes. Uh, there's there's <clears throat> there's other other things that that go on. You have what they call codex, which most trade takes place under the terms of a codex agreement between the two trading partners. And understand that, you know, typically this is company to company. It isn't country to country. Hmm. Um, but what the trade agreements do is, is that, that it strengthens that it, beyond what codex does. Codex allows negotiations between the two parties if there's a dispute, and they try to step in. But when you get certain circumstances, when it gets elevated to the country level, then then you have to have trade agreements that that are binding and uh, and set the rules. And that's really what it's all about: is setting the rules. We uh, it, uh oh, go ahead. <clears throat> I was going to say we need to go to a break here in about a minute. Uh, when we get back, I'd like to have you respond to some of the criticisms that I hear out there about the trade deal. And the main one that I hear when I go looking on the sites, and I see lots of groups opposed to the trade deal, including AFL-CIO, the Sierra Club, and their arguments are simply that if we do this negotiation, uh, our environmental laws will be degraded, our uh, unions and our workers will be hurt, and it will not be good for America. When we get back, I'd like you to answer, you know, you've seen a lot of this. Do you think that's true, or are they just fear-mongering? Okay, we're going to come right back, 721-1290, We have two lines open. You want to get into this conversation, especially if you're involved in agriculture, if you're a farmer or a rancher or whatever, you grow crops here in, uh, in western Montana. I'm sure you want to get in on this conversation. We're going to come right back. And thanks for joining us here on Talk Back. It is Thursday, July the 9th, 2015. Interesting conversation going on right now with a farmer from the Big Scan, a Big Sandy area. Dan Kidd's joining us. A uh, farmer from the Kid Brown Farms, a Kid, Kid Brothers, Brothers Farms, are, and a member of the Agriculture Policy Advisory Committee. We're talking about the, uh, the, the, the new trade deal that uh, has been, I guess, shrouded in mystery, I guess. And that's what bothers people so much, Dan, is it's, it's, it's uh, we hear stories of it's in a locked room, and you, you can only go in and see it for a certain amount of time. You can't take notes, you can't take pictures, you can't write anything down. I, I, I'm wondering, what, what is that all about? Well, that's, <clears throat> that's not entirely true. <laughs> uh, okay, but it sure sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First, first of all, there's... The, none of this has ever been put together into one room, okay? There, there are drafts on all segments of this, and, you know, each portion of it, if, if, if somebody had a question about, uh, uh, like uh, a congressman had a, a question about a certain aspect of it, he could go to the USTA or... or uh, FAS and ask specific questions about it, and and they, for the most part, uh, would explain it unless it was a situation that they were in negotiations over that particular topic at that particular point in time. Then you know they're not going to release that information, you know, you, until now. As far as I understand, as far as I understand, Dan. This was supposed to be wrapped up like four years ago, um, and things have drawn out. It's been harder. I think part of that's because other countries have gotten involved. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but uh, it sounds like the negotiations were a little bit more fierce than people thought. What are they still trying to hash out? What elements are at, at end right now? Well, you hit the nail right on the head. <clears throat> this would have been completed uh, you know, two or three years ago, except... Japan now has entered, Canada has now entered, and Mexico has entered into the agreement, um, which which uh, I personally welcome that because I think that's that's good for uh, American agriculture and Mon in, in in Montana agriculture. Uh, you know, I see uh, increased uh, if, if if this 
is successful. I see increased exports of beef and pork coming out of Montana. I see uh, potentially uh, increase in exports in barley, which uh, we've been um, completely, basically shut out of that market uh, for several years. Um, I see that opportunity may be coming back. As far as our wheat exports are concerned, uh, I think the agreement uh, uh, enhances our position uh, with uh, our main trading partner, which would be Japan uh, for Montana. Um, I, I see uh, new opening market opportunities, uh, particularly with uh, Vietnam. Um, Incidentally, one of the things that uh, I wrote down here, the environmental uh, uh, and labor. Oh, yeah, those uh, were my questions that, before the break, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, as far as trade agreements are concerned, this agreement will have the probably the strictest environmental rules and, uh, and compliance of any trade agreement ever crafted before. Um, have you and, told uh, have you told your, have you told our senators that or do they disagree with you or or what? Oh, oh no, uh, no, no. Uh, I don't know that our senators disagree. Uh, Senator Danes, of course, uh, uh, you know, voted for uh, TPA, and uh, and I believe that he will support uh, TPP. But that being said, uh, you know, none of us. Uh, you know, can go out and say, well, yes, we're going to support TPP. We support the methodology of it right now. But until the agreement is actually completed, you know, nobody can go out. You know, I'm not going to say I'm going to support TPP because I have not seen the final agreement. You know, it's... It's like saying you're supporting something that hasn't been finished yet and could end up being bad. You don't know. That's right. You know, you you there could be there could be a you know uh, an element in there that would would change my mind. Let, you know? let, let me ask you this though: we're well along in the negotiations. Most of the elements, I assume, have been kind of concreted down. Um, there's just a few, I'm guessing, uh, major issues to talk about. Of what you've seen that, so far, of what you've seen so far that has been agreed upon, it it seems generally good to you. Uh, yes, yes. From what you know, from what I've seen so far, and of course, now my I have blinders. You have to kind of look, understand that. You know, my focus is on agriculture. Uh, that that doesn't mean I you know don't care about environmental or I don't care about labor. Uh, you know, that's not the case. But you know, I do have blinders. You know, because when you get negotiations like this with eleven different countries. Um, you know that they're they're all going to be agricultural trading with us, uh, and you know so you want to make sure that you know that the agreement is across the board sound, um, and uh, you know we don't give away something. Now, I, if the, what, the one thing about any successful, to go, especially international negotiation, what we've learned with the Montana World Affairs Council on the radio, that you know you've got a good agreement if nobody gets everything they want, right? Well, yeah. I mean, there's that's right, and, and that's one reason why TPA uh, is is so important is because what it does is you it forces Congress to either vote for it or against it, and, and not amend it. And and why that is so important is because you may pressure a country into giving up something that that is extremely sensitive to them or market access to something that is extremely sensitive to them, but at the same time, you may have to turn around and give them something, and our negotiators have to weigh out the balance of, well, this is worth $3 billion a year to the U.S. economy, and we're giving up $300 million a year, and we have TAA, which the best traded adjustment authority, which then we can offset with federal dollars and help this particular industry that's being harmed. We're going into a break, um, but I'm going to ask you a really hard question. When we come back, I'd like to get your answer. Here's the tough question for you. Uh, in the agriculture side, the, sp the specialty you're over, you've talked a lot about the good things that would come to Montana, extra trading, 
uh, closer relations with Japan and the countries we already have good relations with. Um, but my question is, under that purview, what is the biggest thing we're giving up in the trade negotiations? Yeah, we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. We, by the way, we have two lines open, uh, 721-1290, And I think it's also time to talk about some agriculture of our yeah, own. Yeah, speaking of agriculture. Uh, yeah, uh, we got coffee beans. Uh, <laughs> we, I think we have to import them most of the time. I think so, yeah. But uh, we'll brew them here in Missoula for you and give you a free cup of that coffee. All you have to do is call 721-1290. And the Rocket Coffee Stand, uh, supporter of TalkBack, will give you a free cup of coffee and your slab of toast along with your choice of spread, all you, have to do, all you have to do is call 721-1290. First caller wins the free coffee and toast. Go. Hey, welcome back to Talkback, 721-1290, John King's over there. We have Dan Kidd on the phone with us out in Big Sandy. And I still have free coffee to give away, 721-1290. Yeah. And Dan has been just waiting to, to take my tough question <laughs> and answer it, I'm sure. So my big question before the break, Dan, was, you know, uh, you talked a lot about all the good things that we're getting from uh, the agricultural side of the negotiation so far, right? He's not a prophet, as I specified at the beginning of the show. Uh, but, but from what you've seen, what is the biggest thing we would be giving up in the, in the deal? Well, I don't know uh, at this particular point in time because, and, I, and I'll tell you, this is what complicates things, is you, we're, we're getting down to the very tough issues for not only our trading partners but ourselves as to what potentially we may have to uh, give additional market access to that we protect. Like, and can you, can you, can you, I, I realize you can't tell us, you know, where they're, where the dividing lines are, but can you tell us kind of what the issues are in general? I, well, I can tell you this. This is not classified or anything else. We, we have uh, uh, some tariffs on, on dairy products that uh, are very considered by our trading partners as very protectionist. Uh, we have sugar um, uh, tariffs and restrictions that, um, um, you know, again, uh, there are countries that would like to uh, have additional access to our markets in those two areas. Uh, and we do have uh, uh, restrictions on, um, it, when I say dairy, you know, that primarily that's processed products mm -hmm. like uh, cheese and right. that type of thing. Right. So, you know, our list of, of things that we actually protect on the agricultural side is very, very small. And um, so it's, you know, it's, it's public knowledge, you know, uh, and obviously those are the areas that that uh, are some of our trading partners are interested in gaining additional market access. Uh, you know, which uh, with with reduced tariffs, and of course that's what we we try to do too. Is is we want to reduce all the tariffs because. If you reduce tariffs, you lower the price of the product and and thereby increase the consumption, and that's the the basic idea. And that is the United States philosophy: is, is uh, decrease in tariffs. It's interesting you you would say that because one of the things that that I have heard about that there are, there is a a camp, if you will, that is you know is America first and best and uh, America only. Uh, and so uh, uh, re really resistant to uh, uh, businesses moving uh, uh, out of our borders and then bringing stuff back in, we should slap a big tariff on it. So what is wrong with that particular philosophy in today's trading market? Well, uh, that, you know, that philosophy is counterproductive because what it ends up doing is, is it, it, it ends up increasing the cost of those goods to the American consumer. Right, yeah, exactly. Anytime yeah. You, yeah, anytime you slap a tariff on something or you, or you, uh, you know, impose certain restrictions on something, all that does is just drives up the cost to our consumer. You know, we, we have to evolve to a, a situation where that... W you know, we have to become more competitive. And, and we're seeing that in the automobile industry. We're see, seeing it in, 
a lot of different things uh, like uh, uh, washing machines and that type of thing. Those jobs are actually coming back to the United States because, you know, we're more competitive. Um, you know, so these things have a tendency to balance around. Um, you know, uh, the other side of it is, is you know, we're, we're a, a developed nation and we pride ourselves in technology and, and of course, technology is one of, one of the biggest uh, assets that we have and we export our technology and our people all over the world. Um, you know, like the semi-tool, the old semi-tool here in, uh, right. in uh, uh, Kalispell now applied materials. I mean, I know two kids from Big Sandy that work for that company and, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we'd love to have them back in Big Sandy, but there's no way in the world you're going to get them back. Mm. Yeah. Now, you, you work on the agriculture part, but my understanding is there's 27 or 32 different sections, including everything from intellectual property to environmental regulation. Uh, are you under one of the most fought-over pieces, or is this one that's pretty much wrapped up? Well, agricultural... T- Agricultural uh, is probably the most encompassing, so there, therefore it, it becomes the most, usually the most difficult. Everybody's got to eat. And, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and most of our trading partners, uh, you know, have sensitivity in the agricultural sect- sector far more than they do in, in the other areas. Uh, and, you know, you have to understand, too, that, you know, you, you take uh, our modern farmer versus a, a farmer in uh, Vietnam or some underdeveloped nation. Our farmer has a distinct advantage. You know, we 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 are more mechanized. Uh, we have more technology, um, and so you know, th- these countries get really sensitive about the fact that you know we we could displace these people well what, what, what happens to them i mean they have no education you know so, so you have to understand from their perspective um <clears throat> they, they they're sensitive about putting their pro- producer out of business yeah. our position is you know our our position is is that you know a rising tide all boats rise right and yeah um, you know, if you eventually, lower the tariff, <laughs> yeah, eventually, if you lower the tariff, people can eat more and that, that little farmer you're trying to protect will actually benefit by expanding trade. Okay. We're up against a break. Go ahead, John. Oh, I was just going to say, it's not just the poor countries either. Uh, Japan famously fights for, uh, imports on meat and uh, I believe on agriculture. When I was living there, the price of rice was very high because they didn't want a lot of external rice product coming in. All right. And part of it was to preserve a way of life, a way of growing rice that they've been doing for a long time. Okay, we're going to come right back. If you have a question or comment, give us a call. Fascinating. I know you're learning a lot. I know I am. Dan Kidd is joining us, a, uh, a farmer from Kidd Brothers Farms in Big Sandy, Montana, and he's been working on this trade deal for quite some time, and we'll continue to pick his brain here in just a few minutes. Hey, we're back on Talkback, 721-1290, uh, 1-800-568-5309. Uh, Dan Kidd is joining us, a farmer from yeah, Kidd Brothers Farms in Big Sandy. We're talking about the trade agreement, and we do have a caller uh, that wants to visit with you. So, Dave, you're on with Dan. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning. I understand that uh, the consumer benefits from free trade, but, but does the country? We're running $45 billion trade deficit just this last month. I mean, are, the, are we... Coming in just a country of consumers and not of workers. Um, I mean, how do you see that as benefiting? Well, <clears throat> by lowering trade barriers and uh, and making our products more competitive globally, okay, by lowering uh, our the tariffs of of the country we're trying to do business with, that <clears throat> it, it that's what brings our trade deficits down. Uh, unfortunately, we have an appetite for importing crude oil. We have an appetite for this and that that always has has always kept our trade deficits high. Uh, agriculture is 
probably the number one industry that we have in lowering uh, um, the uh, the trade deficits. And and it seems to me, ahead. Dan, to, to follow up um, in your response to Dave, it seems to me that uh, we have a surplus of land that can be used to produce food, but it's not always valuable unless there's a place you can ship it to it's at a reasonable a rate. Right, it's got to be a market. Certainly, uh, yeah. agricultural is important to this country, but not everyone can be a farmer. And, I mean, we used to be an exporter of steel. Now we're not. We used to be an exporter of aluminum, and now we're not. I mean, you can go down the list. What are, I mean, we can't all go on to the farm and be farmers. Um, what are people going to do? And, um, and if you say education, well, how, many people, how much knowledge do you need um, to be a farmer? Uh, if there isn't the jobs... Okay. Uh, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't agree with you more. Thanks, Dave. And w- one one of the one of the things that in expanding trade agreements d- does, and I'll and I'll just give you an example. You raised steel and you raised aluminum. Um, one of the problems that we have is is China basically uh, took over our um, you know our markets for steel, and and they're illegally. Even under the WTO rules, uh, subsidizing that industry and exporting and displacing jobs here. The only way you really can offset that is by entering into strict trade agreements that disallows that type of situation, where you know they're obviously uh, subsidizing that industry, and they have. And so, you know, that's the only way around it. I mean, you could you, you can try to take a case to the WTO. It takes years and years uh, to to get it through. Um, and then at, at that particular point, you're not assured of the outcome. Meanwhile, uh, you know, you've got steel plants that close. You've got aluminum plants that close. People are out of work. And that's <clears throat> that's the only real way that you can get around this is to enter into agreements. And interestingly, w- what the TPP will do ultimately is is it will force China to uh, change their policies because they will be the country on the outside looking in, and they they want to trade with with those with those countries, but. We will have a preferential advantage over them with this trade agreement. Interesting. And so we're basically robbing market share from China, and, and not robbing, but uh, we're negotiating right, market exactly, share away exactly. from China. Hey, we're up yeah, against a break, yeah. Dad. So go ahead, go ahead, Dan. I have a quick question from you, uh, for you from Katie. She says, "Will this a negotiation involve country of origin la- labeling?" Okay, but, uh, is that part of the deal, Dan? <clears throat> I, I can't speak to that because I. It would not be. Um, it would not be something that is our position. Okay. Now that being said, country of origin labeling gets to be very uh, com- a complex issue because it, it's not necessarily country of origin, but. We do have to recognize, and other countries have to recognize, some of our labels that are, um, like, say, champagne grapes, for instance, in France. We can't violate that. It's not a country of origin label. It's an actual intellectual property right. So, But in answer to her question is, to my knowledge, I do not believe this uh, you know, broad-based country of origin labeling is not going to be part of this. Okay, we're going to come right back. Seven two one twelve ninety. We have a couple lines open if you uh, would like to visit with Dan Kidd. And it'd be interesting to when we come back. Uh, China, has, their stock market has turned around, and uh, they were they were headed to a major slump, and they turned it around. And, and be, you might be interested to find out how they did that. We're going to come right back and talk about it uh, along with Dan and with some other uh, topics that uh, you might find of interest. With Dan Kidd, we're talking about the big trade deal going all around the world. We'll be right back.
Talk back, rolling right along, 721-1290, talking with Dan Kidd. And uh, Dan, uh, when uh, when John mentioned China just a minute ago, China and Russia, it uh, brought to mind a news story that I I actually read this morning on our Money Page report about how uh, Asian stock markets have been plunging. I mean, people were genuinely terrified as to what the the stocks all over the world were plunging. Well, here's, here's how they did it. Here's how they turned it around. A flurry of measures announced yesterday included a government order to state companies and executives to buy shares. The official Xinhua News Agency reports a directive from the China Securities Regulatory Commission requires investors owning more than 5% of a company's shares to not sell for the next six months. So, <laughs> no wonder the thing turned around. Yeah. Uh, I think it's I think it's a good evidence of something Dan was talking about earlier, where the government is so involved in the private sector they can uh, wheel and deal in ways that most other countries can't. I mean, the U.S. would have a hard time. I mean, I know we have QE three and right, yeah, uh, we've yeah. done other big things, but um, they do stuff like this. They f- mess with their currency. They uh, they steal intellectual property. They, they, a lot of stuff happens, and uh, that's actually, I think, one of the big motivations behind this trade agreement is to get other people in the region on board and kind of isolate China. Um, w- what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I understand we're, we're leaving agriculture and going to international politics, but uh, it seems to be it's so obvious that China and Russia have a role to play in these negotiations. Well, it's, it, it gets back to the premise of why you get involved in trade agreements, and that's rule-based trading. And, and when it, rule-based trading is, is a pretty broad uh, when you, it, because it, it, it can uh, eliminate or punish uh, uh, acts that are uh, harmful uh, to to the other trading partners that are in this agreement, and uh, and and it's not that we're trying to isolate China, uh, but what it does is it probably well it will ultimately it will bring China um, forward to more of a rule based uh, trading partner, and and they're obviously going to want to enter into. Uh, agreements they'll probably want to try to enter into this agreement at some point in time is that is, uh, is that is that something is that something that will be allowed or, or or are they deliberately being left out at this point no uh they they were not left out they could they could have petitioned to join and i'm sure that they, they would have been allowed let, to, let, just like canada and, and mexico and japan i think that's a great question though peter a lot of people don't realize this didn't just spring up uh seven months ago when people started electioneering on it. Right. Uh, this has been going on for for how long, uh, Dan? Uh, I think five or six years. I mean, well, five years. You, you know, this evolved from a different uh, set of trading, uh, a different agreement that was start, started to be put in place in Asia that did not include the United States. That's so like, it was like... Actually, it was like Brunei and Vietnam and New Zealand, right? Or I think those are three of the yeah. four. Uh, yeah. And yeah, then and then was... and then it broadened. Other people wanted into this free trade agreement, so more people started tacking on, and we went from four that... to now. There's twelve countries involved, and the latest three were really big ones because they are big players in trade: Japan and Canada, and Mexico, and they also have. Uh, especially Japan, some strict rules that different countries don't like. Well, they have a tariff structure over there that uh, is, is you know, very protectionist. You know, you have, you know and you have to understand, you know, Japan uh, is a um, import dependent, especially on food. You know, they're not self-sustaining on food at all. And so, it, you know, it is, a, a, you know, it's a national security issue as far as the Japanese are concerned when it comes to food. Yeah, they need cheap access to it. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, they use their tariff structure to to try to keep their farmers in business over there, um, which, 
it, it, you know, it increases the cost of food. I don't know what the actual statistics are anymore, but I, I, I suspect that they pay at least twice, maybe three times as much uh, of their disposable income goes uh uh, to food, I think ours is like eight percent. I, I think theirs is pushing thirty percent. Right. Hey, we're up against a, a break, Dan. And when we come back from the break, I want to ask you a couple of questions. The first is, uh, is it even possible for the concept of quote free trade to exist all over the world? And if it did, what would that look like from from your perspective? Since you've been involved in these negotiations. If uh, <laughs> and it may be kind of a nebulous uh, 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 discussion here, but I, I really like to know from your perspective: Is free trade even possible around the world? We'll be right back with more in a minute. Seven two one twelve ninety is the number, and this, of course, is Talk Back. We'd love to have you be a part of the show. Uh, we have uh, two lines open. Seven two one twelve ninety is our number. Talking with Dan Kidd, a farmer from Kidd Brothers Farms in Big Sandy. He's a member of the Agricultural Policy Advisory Committee. Let's talk about free trade for a second. Uh, Dan, is is that is, is that a concept that uh, even exists anywhere in the world? Well, it's definitely our stated uh, position. The United States. I mean, we're we're advocates of free trade. We're a believer that barriers increase the 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 cost of goods, and which decreases uh, the consumption and 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 in general harms people. You know, um, so you know th- th- that is the United States' uh, stated position. Is is that you know we we well and and. We practice what we preach. You know, we're we're the most accessible country in the world uh, as far as other countries exporting to us, and and unfortunately, that has some disadvantages, especially if the partner that you're trading with is is doing something that uh, is illegal, like subsidizing something that. Uh, you know that they agreed that they wouldn't do that displaces jobs in the United States, and, and we and we've seen that day like, raise that like, issue. Would would that be like Canadian timber? Well, I, I, I think our own I think our own environmental policy probably has more okay. more to do, more to do with uh, with us bringing timber in from Canada. Okay, just check, but yeah. Yeah, there, there, yeah, there's another thing that I wanted to bring up. Uh, you know, a lot of this won't affect us. We're not involved in negotiations. We're not Dan Kidd. We don't get to see that. Uh, but we very much do get to vote in Montana. And it's interesting to me to watch how this has affected our local politicians. Ryan Zinke was on this show. Right. Uh, what was it? Less than six months ago. He said he was against it. Then he apparently got some bill in there to add less, uh, more transparency, he says. And then he he's for it. Uh, Danes, I believe, has always been for it. Yes, bill. Danes has been for it. But Tester doesn't talk about it, but as far as I know, he voted against TPA and has been against the bill. So of the four people that I know who have read this thing, or what what it, what there is of it, know about it, uh, Dan Kidd, Danes, uh, Zinke, and Mr. Tester, we've got one that's kind of waffly, one that's against it, and two that are for it. My question for you, Dan, is what are you reading that's different than what John Tester is reading? You're both in Big Sandy. Can't you just meet across the fence and say <laughs> hi and, and, and figure things out? Well, it, you know, I respect uh, Senator Tester's position. Uh, um, and um, his, his basic complaint is, is that, you know, he, he, he would like to see them have, um, or his argument is, is that, have more um, involvement in the negotiations, and um, <clears throat> I understand the the difficulties in in that process. So uh, you know, I would disagree with that. In that, you you there is no secrets in Washington D.C. Okay, and. The minute that you start... You should tell um, Hillary that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Just let her in on that piece of information. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And, and so if you're, you know, if you're doing some intense negotiations and trade-offs because it's in the benefit of the country, um, 
you know, but at the same token, you know, like, you know, negotiations implies one thing. And that is you're getting something and usually giving up something. And so those are those are difficult things, and sometimes those things have to be held fairly close to the chest because, you know, you're not sure that the guy sitting across the table from you that you're negotiating with is going to cave in to you. So this is a very... You what you want. This is a very so high-stakes poker game, Dan. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so, so, so I, I, I can see the the gambler and people who are del- finally getting this. They're finally getting that this whole thing is a negotiation. It's back and forth. It's trying to, if you will, a chess match. Trying to, uh, th- what, what is your opponent's next move? Three or four moves down the line. How do I counter that? How do I check that? How do I get him into checkmate? How do I win this battle? How do, how do I make my company come out ahead or, or my country? Uh, come out ahead, while yet still allowing other countries to have some successes, so we all win something, right? I mean, isn't that kind of the strategy? Yeah, absolutely, it, it, it is because you know you you trust your negotiators, and and your negotiators, um, you know, have have people uh, like me that, that uh, you know advise them on particular aspects. In other words, I'm focused on on agriculture. Uh, they'll have advisors that you know have a stake in the game on all aspects of the trade, and and those classified advisors uh, give those negotiators uh, their opinion uh, of what this will do for their particular industry, and you know, and that's how the system. You know how the system is it works. Um, you know, and so so you know you have to trust your advisors. So that's why they created the advisory committees is because the those negotiators have to have feedback from people that they can trust, and that they're not going to go out and uh, call a reporter and say, "Well, this is this is what's going to happen here," and. I'm I'm not very happy about it. Okay, gotcha. Um, gotcha. You know, so it, um, you know, hey, hey, and d- like d- you say, it, d- it, it is it is we're, it is a poker game. We have a, less than a minute left, so real quick. Oh, we, I, I, if if people want to get more information about this, Dan, is there a website or anything like that they can go to, or just just watch the news? Well, you know, it, unfortunately the. Watch the news is probably not the best. But, <laughs> I guess not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, uh, actually, actually, people, you know, on the agricultural side, uh, you know, they can call into, uh, you know, uh, you can go onto uh, Foreign Ag Services website in USDA. You can go to USTR. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, USTR, and you we can, are you can send them. Yeah, we are completely out of time, Dan. Uh, we're up against uh, our final break. Thanks for coming, and we will see you tomorrow.